people get started. So I see a question from Anita. Um, in the new world, will there be babies born as, as far as 6520? So the answer is in the millennium, that is in the thousand year reign of Christ, that is right after the, you know, the, the uh, battle of Armageddon, at the end of the seven year tribulation, there's a battle of Armageddon, Revelation 19, and then Revelation 20, verses one through six, talk about the thousand year reign of Christ, the millennium, which is what Isaiah 65, uh, about verse, verse 20, which you're referencing talks about and during that thousand year reign of Christ yes people will be born in the millennium babies will be born people will live and die during the millennium the ones not 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 us who have glorified bodies but the ones who are in their natural human bodies they will live and die uh, during the millennium but in the new heavens and the new earth, there we said most likely from what we understand in scripture, that will not happen because we said in class that we, you know, when we are all, when we are in our glorified bodies, we are like the angels of God. We don't procreate. Is that okay? All right. Okay, any other questions of um, things we have covered so far? Uh, before we, Christopher, please go ahead. Ah, yes, uh, thank you, Pastor. Um, I just, just, I'm just trying to uh, look at uh, uh, the, um, the rapture in, in sort of conjunction, conjunction with, the, uh, with these signs. Mm. And I um, just wanted to get a, confirmation that these signs could be independent of of the rapture itself and um, uh, hypothetically the, the rapture could happen uh, anytime um, you know at, you know during during these these signs lead, lead all the way up to the uh, battle of uh, Armageddon and uh, when when Jesus actually comes comes down onto the earth so um, um, hypothetically, um, it could happen. You know, <laughs> it could happen tomorrow, and uh, you know, there could be a could be uh, you know a, a, a gap between the rapture and then you know this uh, this uh, second coming of, of Jesus. So I just wanted to get a confirmation on that, and what is your view on that? Okay. Um, so yeah, so uh, as we talk about. You know these signs. Um, these signs have to be understood. Not just saying that uh, all of them have to be fulfilled before the rapture, because some of these, for example, Ezekiel thirty-eight, what we have been saying, and then the previous one when you talked about the one world, the one world economic system and uh, identification system, those are things that are actually fulfilled during the rapture, uh, during the tribulation. Sorry. Therefore, so those will actually come together or actually be fulfilled during the tribulation. So the rapture already happens before that. So as we are looking at the signs, we're just saying that things that need to be fulfilled during the tribulation, there's a build up towards it. So to answer your question, the rapture will take place before these things are actually culminated the culmination of these signs the actual fulfillment of uh, you know um, what we've been talking about is equal 38 or those things will happen after the rapture and so the answer is yes the rapture will take place uh, before uh, you know many of these things are actually fulfilled because these will be fulfilled during the seven year tribulation period now how much of time gap will there be from the time the rapture takes place and the beginning of the tribulation? Um, uh, just based on scripture, the Bible, of course, doesn't state you know so much time as per se, 
but just based on what we see in scripture, it could be a very, very short time. Because Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2 says that there's only one thing that's restraining the man of sin from being revealed. And when that which restrains is taken out of the way, then the son of perdition will be revealed. Uh, it's it's Second Thessalonians chapter 2. So it's giving us a, a picture, so to speak, where it's, it's almost happening one after the other with very little time in between. Now, again, you know, the, that very little, uh, you know, is it what is it? You know, ten days? Is it one year? I don't know, but it's 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 indi indicating that when what that which restraints is taken out of the way, the antichrist is going to be So it's going to be soon after that. We just don't know exactly, you know, in terms of days or uh, how, how quickly. Um, so it's not a very definite answer to your question, but. Overall, the answer is yes. Rapture happens, then tribulation begins. I hope it's okay. Right, sir. So, I mean, to, to, to confirm uh, that uh, the rapture could could really happen at any time. Yes, anytime. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, some of these signs. Um, uh, you know, we are, we as believers uh, would not really have uh, would not really experience it at all. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, yes, we we don't we won't be here when these things happen. Yeah, right. Okay, thank you, Kennedy. Your question, please. Yes, thank you, thank you. Who is restraining the Antichrist currently? The restrainer. Uh, the church. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Shri Kavar, your question, please. Thank you, sir. So my question is, um, as a believer, um, when we know um, that these are prophecies uh, which has to be fulfilled when we see the persecutions and other things, um, then um, uh, many times when we see these things, we, we sometimes we... Um, we move, move to pray against all these things. For example, uh, we try to st we pray that God let it be stopped. Let it be, uh, even though we know that uh, this is the end time and uh, uh, these things has to be fulfilled as per the power of the prophecy. So how much uh, it is, uh, how true it is like, uh, uh, you know, that um, uh, when we are praying against these things uh, to be stopped, is it the right way of praying or as a believer, how we have to pray? Like, uh, is it only we have to pray that God, in the midst of all these persecutions, uh, guard us, keep us safe? What kind of a prayer we uh, we should pray as a believer? Thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. So, good question. So, we have to pray. Of course, we want to pray the will of God uh, in any situation, and uh, so some things we do know about the will of God. What is God's will? He wants people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants people to experience goodness, right? So that, those are things we definitely do pray, even in, so example, in the, in, in the crisis that we're seeing right now, and in, 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 in what's happening in Ukraine, you know, 10 million people already displaced. The so numbers are just keep increasing every, every day. Uh, so we pray for their well-being, we pray for their salvation, we pray for peace in the land, for the land to be restored and the war, war to cease because, you know, Psalm 49 says, God causes wars to cease. So we, we pray those prayers and those are in line with the will of God, right? So we're saying, God, uh, we want to see, uh, what was it? Um, yeah, uh, we, we want to see uh, uh, this war to, you know, stop. We want to see nations changed and healed and restored and so on. So we're praying for the well-being of people, which is God's will. God desires for that. Um, now, what, has, what God has determined to happen will happen in the sense that, yeah, 
a time will come when you know Ezekiel 38 will be fulfilled. Uh, we won't be there to see it, but that is going to happen. Uh, and even in the midst of that, suppose there was a believer, and they, of course there will be believers. Uh, what would they pray? We would pray for the salvation of Israel, we pray uh, for the protection of Israel, and we would pray for the salvation of people, and we would pray for peace, but uh, ultimately, you know, what God has determined will, will take place. So from our perspective, we are praying the will of God. What is the will of God? People to be saved, the well-being and the preservation of people, uh, uh, for wisdom to prevail in the hearts of the leaders. Uh, these are things that are, is the will of God for us to pray. And so we're praying again, we're praying aligned to the will of God because it's the word of God and that's that's how we pray. Thank, Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Nothing else? Any other questions? Yeah, yeah Christopher, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's just a follow-on question to my earlier question. So, although we, we are, we, we know that uh, um, you know, the rapture will, um, will will happen before the fulfillment of the of, of these signs, um, is there any sort of, um, you know, kind of a definitive um, event which could indicate that the rapture could it's it's unlikely that the rapture would happen before before that 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 event. Um, is there? I mean, is there anything in, in, in the Bible or you know, or, you know, even through the through the um, study of uh, eschatology to uh, you know to indicate that? Hmm. So, if we look at all these signs which we are going to enumerate, or which we are enumerating right now, I think the biggest sign to say time for rapture is, is the readiness of the church. Because the rapture is the gathering of the saints, the church being taken up. And the church will only be taken up when it is ready. Because in Ephesians 5 it tells us he's coming for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Now that's the rapture, right? So that cannot happen until the church is brought into this place uh, of being a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. So if you ask me, what is that one sign of all these signs that we talk about? Because of course, many of these signs are going to take place during the tribulation later on. Of all these signs, which is that one sign that will take place just before the rapture? The, the one sign that has to take place. Well, Ephesians 5. The church has to be brought to this place of being a glorious church without spot or wrinkle because he's coming back for such a church. In other words, the rapture cannot take place until the church is ready. So that's the sign I would point to. So that would mean that uh, the churches will be united and uh, there will be some, some kind of a, uh, you know, togetherness of, of, the, of the churches. Uh, uh, what what could be a definition of of this glorious church? Mm -hmm. So now churches coming together doesn't mean you know uh, that we would all like. Now obviously we're not going to be under the same roof. We're not going to be under the same name per se. In the sense, you know, we're not all going to be called you know X Y Z church. That so that will not happen. Uh, we're not going to all be under one denomination. That that's not going to happen. There will be many denominations, but the kind of unity we're talking about is uh, what Paul wrote in Ephesians four. We all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Yeah. So, what's going to unite us? The faith and knowing Jesus. You know, of course, we're all going to have different variations in how we worship and styles of worship and these kinds of things. But we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And we come to a perfect man. And I'm quoting Ephesians 4, 13, 14. We come to a perfect man, to a mature man. What is a mature man? A mature man is able to fully represent 
So be the church will be brought to a place where it fully represents or it, it, it represents Jesus, right? Or Ephesians 5, a glorious church. What is a glorious church? A church that is emitting or manifesting the glory of God. Right? Without spot or wrinkle, what are the spots and the wrinkles? It's the sin and the division, the strife. Those become wrinkles. So that unity is not, you know, the unity is a spiritual unity, unity in the, the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. So what is happening globally actually is very wonderful. You know, and if, for example, if you, if you look into this classroom that uh, we are all connected, all of us have actually come from uh, diverse backgrounds. We are from diverse backgrounds. We all have our, you know, our individual differences, our individual, you know, in individual experiences and whatever. But what have we agreed upon? We are agreed upon the unity of the faith and of the Son of God. We are agreed upon Jesus. Okay. And what is our desire? Our desire is to be a perfect man, to be a mature man, to be like Jesus, to fully represent Jesus. And so, you know, what, what is happening right here in this little group is, uh, in some way, it's an expression of, you know, what God is doing in the church worldwide. And this is happening worldwide, meaning there are people everywhere. God is working all around the world. And, uh, uh, you know, people are being brought to this place of understanding, of, know, of the knowledge of the Son of God, and saying, we want to be mature. Now, it doesn't mean everybody in the Christian world is going to be like that. No. There are, lo there are going to be lots of people who will still be stuck in the denomination and in uh, their own religious traditions. They're going to miss out on this. But when God looks at the church, that means his people, he sees people who are coming to the unity of the faith. We may belong to different churches and you know we have our own uh, local churches etc but we all in the unity of the faith maturing growing into that mature man the full man representing christ becoming the glorious church and he's coming back for such people will there be people in denominations who don't bother anything yeah there will still be those but uh, they'll just be having a form of religion without the power Right, so that is, and that's going to, you know, that's going to be one of the signs we'll talk about. So Anita says, where are we in that regards? Can you point that if possible? Yeah. So hopefully I answered your question, Anita. You know, God is working. If you look at things and you separate out the shell, that is the form and the denomination, and you look at what's happening in the lives of people, it is happening, right? And uh, we are beginning to be able to uh, to love each other because we have one thing in common: it's the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Right? We all are different. Uh, you know, we all may worship in different churches and have different uh, names and labels and denominations, all that. But we can still love each other and work because once one thing: unity of the faith. You know, the knowledge of the Son of God. That's happening. And it's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, move forward. We'll have time again later to take up questions. Um, let's try to cover a few more signs. So, so we talked about, uh, you know, peace talks Israel, planned to buy the land. Number eight, is the church coming to maturity? Which is what we were talking about right now. So this is a very important sign. You know, uh, Paul wrote several places. He said in Ephesians 4, 11 to 15, he said that the Lord has placed in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. They're going to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. They're going to edify the body of Christ. For what? Till we all come to the unity of the faith. That means they're going to be doing their work, doing their work, doing their work. And it's going to result in us coming to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. This is where we're going to be united. And this is what unites us. It's 
faith in God and faith in, in the God we know, in the knowledge of the Son of God. And we will all come to a perfect man, a mature man. That means we are going to come to a place where we can represent Christ fully. And that should be our each one of us individual desire. Lord, I want to represent you fully. I want to be like Jesus. I, 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 I'm not, I may not be 100% like him, but I'm growing into that full measure, into that stature, the fullness of Christ. And, you know, we won't be tossed to and fro with all this wind of doctrine and men, you know, not that this is going to be happening. You know, there's going to be all these winds blowing, different ideas and things that uh, people are coming up with, but none of these things matter. We're going to just leave them all aside. We're going to grow up. The main thing that is that we're going to be focused on is we want to grow up and be like Jesus. We're not worried about all these winds of doctrine. It's, you know, silly things that people preach these days. They're not interested in that. Our focus is we want to be like Jesus. In Acts 3, um, while Peter was preaching in Acts 3, he says, you know, uh, he, he's going to send Jesus Christ and heaven must receive, or the word receive simply means retain. Jesus must be until the times of restoration of all things. So how long is Jesus going to be retained in heaven? Until this time when things are going to be restored. Until the restoration of all things. Jesus will be retained. So part of this restoration of all things is the church itself. You know, the church itself has to be, you know, of course, there are a lot of other things that need to be restored, but we need to look at the church. The church itself has to be fully restored. Right? And uh, the church being restored is one of the things that. Uh, you know, so until that happens, until that happens, Jesus will be retained in heaven. And when is he going to come? Well, and for what kind of a church is he going to come? And be references just now, you know, uh, he will, he's coming back uh, for a glorious church, not having any uh, spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but a church that is holy and without blemish. So the church is being brought to this state. It's being brought to a place where it is holy, without blemish, no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it's a glorious church, a church that is revealing the glory of God. Now, you know, sometimes when we look at the church, we say, well, how is this ever going to happen? You know, look at all the things that are happening. Uh, there's so much of, you know, fighting and division and all sin and these things happening in the church. How is the church going to become a glorious church? Well, we must look at the history of the church. And you see, where the church has come in just 500 years, Right. So uh, I think you have this course on church history. And, uh, you know, from about 15, I think it was 1583, or I forget the exact year, from the time of the beginning of the Reformation, 1500s. Here we are about 500 years later. From a time when the Bible was available only in Latin, and a few languages, and the, the common man didn't have access to the scriptures. In 500 years, scriptures are available in just, you know, I mean, in all the major languages, people have easy access to it. Churches are everywhere. Uh, people can worship anytime, listen to sermons. It, you know, it's such a big change that's happened. And more and more understanding of the word is is, 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 is is being made available to us today, all in just 500 years. So 500 years ago, people didn't even have a Bible to read. The masses, I'm talking about the people. 500 years later, such a big difference. People know the truth. 
the truth is being proclaimed. So the church is being, you know, brought into this place of becoming a glorious church. So it is, it is really amazing. Now, our focus should be on the people who are being changed, not necessarily the system that's around it. The system around it may, may be bad. Right? The structure, the system, the politics, the, all those kind of things that are happening, it of course is very disappointing. It is very bad. And they, we don't have to worry whether that changes. Don't bother, don't bother with it. Look at the people. People's lives are being changed. People are seeking. People are hungry for God. People are loving Jesus more. People are fellowshipping with each other. You know, uh, and that is happening. So the church, which is really the people, are becoming more and more glorious. The systems around it, the structure around it, don't worry about it may not even change, or it's not going to change. But he's not coming back for the system. He's not coming back for the structure. He's coming back for the church, which is the people. And that definitely is becoming more and more glorious. So today, believers are being challenged to be like Jesus. They're not. You know, nobody cares about being like your denomination or being like, a, you know, a, a, a being a, true to some sort of a form or a structure or a system. Those who want to do that, they, they're going to be dead. I mean, dead meaning spiritually dead, no life. But there are people who say, I want to be like Jesus. I want to grow up in all things to be like him. Now that's the real church. Okay, so this is happening right before our eyes. It's just getting better and better. And sure enough, when this culminates, meaning the Lord will be satisfied. He's okay, my church is ready. It's come into a place where there is no spot or wrinkle, any such thing, and holy and without blemish. And, and you know, uh, of course, God is also doing the shaking, meaning things that shouldn't be part of the church. He's shaking and they're coming down. And, you know, he's, he's, he's shaking up all the, the dirt and the filth and out of the church. He's, he's getting it ready. And when, he's, when he is satisfied, he's going to come. But all we can say is we're getting closer and closer because when you look past the structure and you look past the systems and you look at the people, people are becoming beautiful uh, day after day. Maybe we'll do one more sign. Uh, one or two more. So another sign is the gospel to the nations. And Jesus said in, in that list in Matthew 24, uh, when his disciples said, you know, Lord, what are the signs? What will be the signs of your coming? He said, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Now, I want you to just imagine this with me. Just imagine this with me. If you were standing next to Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, and you were with the 12 apostles, and you were there, and you heard Jesus say, the gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, What would you have thought? Impossible. Impossible. So what? Jesus, you, me, we are living in this tiny place in Jerusalem. And we are going around here and there. We are going up to, you know, about less than 100 kilometers north and south. And we are just moving around here and there preaching this gospel of the kingdom. We hardly have, we don't even have a church. We don't even have a building. Uh, you haven't even written your first book. Uh, nothing. 
and Jesus, you are saying this message that you are preaching and which we have been listening to you, twelve of us, this gospel is going to go to the nations? Now, if you and I, if we were standing there listening to Jesus in Matthew 24, it's like, this cannot happen. I mean, we can't get it 100 kilometers beyond us. In, in our own hometown, people are not believing us. In Nazareth, we are rejected. How is this gospel going to go to the nations? And you're thinking about the Roman government. You know, they are not going to listen to anything like this. This gospel of the kingdom doesn't make sense to them. They have their own kingdom. They have their own gospel. They have power. They are the Romans are in charge. Uh, Rome has, you know, so powerful. Where are we? What message do we have? You know, honestly, if you imagine you are standing next to Jesus and you're listening to him say this, this is going to be one of the signs. What I am preaching here today in Jerusalem, what I am preaching here in this little town of, you know, where in Capernaum and Bethsaida, what we are preaching here, we are going around these little towns and preaching. This message will be heard all over the world. You say, How is it going to be possible, Jesus? Even if we have five lives to live, five, we can't do it. How are we going to do it? And here we are, 2,000 years, and truly, the same message Jesus preached. Starting there in, you know, from uh, Capernaum and Nazareth, and, but, you know, starting there in and around Jerusalem. That same gospel has covered the whole world and it's being preached 24 7 through just about every possible channel, every possible means, in every possible language that we can think of. You know, and uh, it's happened and is happening. And it's one of the signs Jesus gave. This gospel will be preached to all the nations. Then the end will come. Now, it's taken 2,000 years, but it's done. So we are now in the last mile or the last frontier, which is, it's those individual tribes in different places that need to hear the gospel. I mean, otherwise, you know, major cities have already been reached. But it's going beyond the cities into the tribes of the gospel. This is the last frontier, the final, the last mile. That is happening right now. People are pushing for it all over the world. But this is amazing. Okay. So I'm going to stop here and we will uh, cover the, yeah, just a few more. We will cover those next week and we will be done with the course i think uh, next week and uh, and uh, then we will just kind of do a quick review and take more questions um so any thoughts so far any questions so far everyone's good All right, so um, yeah, so basically, you know, we will have probably one more week of classes. Next week, I'll probably finish and just see if there are any more questions, do a quick review. Then month of April will be time for assessments. Um, uh, I will create assessments and put them out. And so the month of April you could use to do the assessments. Um, I'll create an assessments, which will be like last semester, which will be multiple choice um, questions 
um, uh, three sets covering, you know, just bring the whole portion into three parts, questions that get in there. And uh, um, so in the assessments, yeah, just questions covering the content that, uh, that we've gone through. Uh, it will be open book, open Bible and open news questions. So you can refer to everything and uh, answer the questions. Uh, so we'll keep month of April for that, for just to do your work, right? So uh, next year will be your last year, your third year. And uh, uh, th I just, just, just wanted to give you a heads up. The third year, uh, we are going to be doing, um, uh, you know, courses that are a little bit more intense in terms of studying the scriptures. So we you should be doing a lot of book study, uh, going through chapter and verse, understanding the books of the Bible. Uh, but it'll also be a lot of practical. That is, you know, how do you, the church and ministry administration, we'll be talking about it. Uh, we'll talk about um, urban church planting. How do you start a ministry in an urban context, which can be, of course, applied in any any other way. So we'll be dealing with a lot of practical things. You know, how do you run a children's ministry, youth ministry? How do you run small groups? Uh, we talk about media and technology in ministry. And, and uh, so a lot of practical things. Also a lot of study oriented, studying the scriptures, right? But then one of the things I want you to start thinking about is, uh, and some of you may already be doing ministry, uh, or many of you will already be doing ministry. But one of the things I want you to start thinking about is, what are you going to do after you graduate? Right? So you're going to graduate in a, in a year's time, uh, approximately 12 months from now, you'll finish your bachelor's, you'll get your degree, you, you'll have done all these courses, uh, but what are you gonna do? And one of the things we will learn next year in our urban church planning course is how to, how to you know, actually kind of come up, you know, uh, in, in, the, in, in the corporate world, we call it a business plan, right? So when you, when you want to start a business, when you want to start a venture, what do you do? You write a business plan. You put down your thoughts. What are you going to do? So in our course on urban church planting, we will kind of do something like that. And if you want to start a ministry, how would you, what would you write? Church planting. We'll have another course on church and ministry administration. How do you organize that ministry? And uh, how would you do it, right? So, uh, uh, and of course, a lot of things we will share with you, very, very practical, but the objective is you need to put down, if you're going to start a church, what do you need to think about? Uh, or a ministry, you know, so church or some other ministry. If you're going to, um, um, uh, you know, and how do you organize it? How, do, you know, so you learn all these things, but then you need to write it down. And what we are going to set up uh, is, we, you know, we are going to set this up, um, and we've been talking about it for a while, where uh, we will have people, meaning students who have finished their three years with us, to you know submit their what you know what we we'll call as proposals. It's something like if if in, in in the corporate world, if you want to start a business, you want to start something, you have to write it down, and you have to present it to people so that you know you you share your idea with them and convince them that your idea is, is, is feasible, it's good, it's something they need to invest in, right? So we're gonna ask those of, I mean, it's not a compulsory thing, we're gonna give you all the information you need uh, in terms of setting up a church or a ministry in your third year, but then you need to put down what God wants you to do, and right? you need to write it down as a proposal, and um, then you can share it with us, uh, we will review it, and then you know, so we will get ourselves organized in terms of actually, uh, you know, how to fund the ministry, the, the, your your idea, uh, and then you, you you know, so you work out all the details uh, when we talk about accounting and so on and so forth and how you do it, and then uh, when you present that, we can review it, and then you know if 
I'm not saying every proposal will be, you know, uh, funded and accepted, but our desire is to help as many people as we can to start out on their ministry. So whether it's planting a church or maybe it's an urban ministry or a rural ministry or whatever it is, that's something God has to put in your heart. You have to find out. Um, we are not here to tell you what to do, but we are here to show you how to go about it, how to write it down, how to hear from God, how to do your survey, uh, how to you know go about planting a church or starting a ministry and how to administer it, organize it, uh, or how you how you, you can leverage tools and technologies, and how you can, you know, and, and so our goal is to help you, but then you're, you must hear from God. You must write down what God puts on your heart and you must commit to working on it, right? And so then, you know, uh, when that happens and you submit your proposals and then, you know, uh, our, our goal is to bless you. That okay, God, here here are you know, ten churches that 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 can be started, whether in India or outside around the world, uh, or here are the ten different ministries, you know, that we can back up financially and help get it off the ground, and then then you have to run with it. You have to do the work, uh, but we'll be there to you know just be a support and encouragement to you, but. Uh, what I want, the reason I'm talking about it now is I want you to start praying. I want you to start thinking about it and then putting your ideas down. And next year, third year, you'll have courses that will teach you how to, what to think about, how to do your survey, how to plan it out. And then hopefully we'll have some great proposals coming from all of you. And, uh, you know, over the years, that's how all our churches around the country in India have started. There's been students who've gone out and, uh, they have started the churches and they are doing a great work, right? Uh, but now, since your batch, uh, it's opened up across outside of India. Many of you are from outside India and God's uh, helping us position ourselves so that we could help students uh, outside India. So our goal is to help within India, which we are already doing and we can do, we'll continue doing. And then also students who are from outside India. But remember, it's got to be your vision. It's got to be something God wants you to do. Our, job, our goal is just to help you, right? And make sure you become fruitful for God's kingdom. All right, question Abraham says, is it possible to come to India for a month? You're welcome, Abraham. Uh, but I think let's just uh, maybe wait for sometime after August uh, when our campus opens up. Uh, but yeah, those who want to come, you're welcome to do that. Sri Kumar, your question, please. Thank you. Sir. Uh, is it only for the church planting or um, or any other ministries? Yeah, A anything, anything, right? So uh, church planting, of course, is one important aspect. But we will learn next year, you know, urban missions could be church planting. It could be starting something else, example. It could be uh, reaching street children in a certain city. It could be working with, you know, uh, whatever, whatever need you see, right? Ultimately, we have to bring the gospel to all people. So uh, church planting is one way of doing it, uh, but there are just n number of opportunities. Uh, and uh, God puts different things in different people's hearts. Uh, so we have some people who are itinerant ministers, that means they're traveling, but it has to be a really committed minister. Most of what so far is going on is church plants. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, as, as just it all depends on what the student, come, what God puts in the hearts of the students. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. So um, yeah, the reason I brought it up is I just want you to start praying. I want you to start, uh, you know, uh, you need to seek God. You need to pray about it and uh, write down your ideas. And we will tell you how to do it, of course, but uh, pray and see what God, and look around you, you know, in the cities where you are, what is the need, what, what touches your heart, right? That has to come from God into your heart, okay? All right, let's wrap up. Um, 
uh, can I ask please uh, somebody to close in prayer and then we will dismiss. Anybody? Pastor, can I pray? Yeah, go ahead. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful day. Uh, we bless your holy name, Father. Thank you, Father God, for every every precious word what we received from your servant, your Father. Let it be deeply rooted in us. And Father, we pray, Lord Master, let we let we hold on this revelation. Let we hold on, Lord Master, these these words of Father God, so that we can move ahead of Father God. And we pray that, Father God, let these words strengthen us and help us to fight our Lord Master, fight a good fight of faith, Lord Master, in, our, in, the, in this journey of Father God. We ask you that your holy presence and your anointing increase in your servant's life of Father God and strengthen each one of us, O Lord Master, who heard from his, from his mouth. Thank you, Father God, for strengthening him. Thank you for, Lord Master, giving us that grace and understanding to receive your word. All the glory, honor, and praises belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Uh, enjoy Thank the you, Pastor. God bless you. God bless you. I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. God bless. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. See you tomorrow. God bless.